orthodoxy in our whole country is slurry systems. It's all water-based, okay, and you spread this manure out on, your, out on your fields. What we do over here is our carbonaceous diaper, like a sponge. So right over here is carbon. This is our carbon storage shed. Wood chips, junk hay, old hay fodder, leaves, sawdust, peanut hulls. I mean, if it's brown, we want it, okay? Carbon over here, storing. Then over here, we're gonna feed this hay in these boxes. So the cows put their head in here, they eat the hay in these boxes that are on pulleys that we can raise and lower so that as the carbonaceous diaper builds up, we can keep cranking up the hay boxes. And by the time we get to spring, this might be four feet deep in here, all right? Imagine four feet deep here. The cows are standing up here. That's why we have the high sides so the cows don't fall out of the barn, okay? So this just continues to grow up. Now those cows are heavy and they're tromping out the oxygen so that deep bedding pack, that carbonaceous diaper is anaerobic, okay? Anaero that means it's fermenting without oxygen, all right? It's anaerobic. And so as we build this bedding pack, we add corn to it. The corn then, the cows, they drop it all in. The corn then ferments in this bedding pack. So in the spring, when the cows come out and start grazing again, the grass begins to grow, we put in pigs. The pigs then seek the fermented embedded corn, churn it all up like a big egg beater, oxygenate it, aerate it, and turn it from anaerobic to aerobic compost, it composts beautifully, and then we spread it out on the fields, and that's our fertilizer. So that's the entire, that's the fertility program, okay? And what feeds it is the carbon. So the carbon is generated from any source we can find, most of ours on site here on the farm, from uh, tree work. Um, cleaning a fence line, uh, taking down a bunch of uh, junky trees, crooked trees, upgrading the wood light. We're a big believer in the permaculture concept. We need more forest and fewer trees, okay? And so, so as we start working with this carbon economy, in situ, as a fertilizer program, you begin realizing the potential if we, again, that's the practical daily application, but if you back the camera up a little bit and take a, and take a broader view, you realize that if we took all of the money we currently spend on chemical fertilizer, fire control, and insurance paying for burning buildings and infrastructure, and if we invested that in proper forest management, not only would we have far more productive forests, but we would have high organic matter soils, more earthworms, and we would be sequestering carbon in the soil instead of letting it volatilize off in the air. The other thing that we would have is we would have then suddenly a brand new industry, a brand new vocation to honor people who like to work outside with their hands. We have spent now two generations marginalizing people who want to work outside in blue collar work. I mean, when's the last time you heard a guidance counselor in a high school tell an up and coming uh, honor student senior, wow, Mary, your grades are so good, you're so smart, you should be a farmer. No. Farming is reserved for the C minus to F plus students or less, okay? And so I'm suggesting that this model would create thousands and thousands and thousands of little five, six person crews out in our, in our woodlands both public and private, eliminating fires, creating carbon, 
eliminating chemical fertilizers, feeding earthworms, who could come home at the end of the day and when their little children ask them, well, mommy, daddy, what did you do today? They can tell their children what we did was we upgraded the forests and created a carbon base for compost to build soil for nutrient dense food so that you'll have a better place to live in than we had. And I suggest that that's a valuable legacy and we desperately need sacred, noble affirmation for people in our culture who don't aspire to simply fight the, the expressway to spend the day in a Dilbert cubicle pressing numbers into cyberspace all day. We need to make room for the other 40% is the kind of the root number, 40% of the population who likes to have calluses and splinters in their hands and affirm them as important people in our, in our culture. So there's a, there, there's a broad picture here, very practical, growing earthworms, but the implications are broad, socially, culturally, and community-wide. Last thing, when we came to the farm in 1961, I was just four, we averaged 1% organic matter. When I was the size of these little kids here, I can well remember walking these fields and never setting foot on a piece of vegetation. That's how barren they were. There were large areas, a uh, quarter acre in size, that were nothing but rock. Nothing but rock. I mean, not weeds, not grass, not just rock. We're all the top, we'd lost anywhere from five to eight feet of topsoil. Today, we average 8.2% organic matter, from 1% to 8%. Every 1% increase stores an additional 20,000 gallons of water per acre. So seven percentage points times 20,000 is 140,000 gallons times 100 acres, just say, 14 million gallons that we can now hold that you couldn't hold in 1961. I'm not bragging, I'm simply giving humble gratitude and appreciation for a system of abundance that's here for us to appreciate and massage. So often in modern agriculture, we have this idea that nature is this, is this, this reluctant partner that we've got we've to control and, 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 and get in a half Nelson and wrestle with and uh, 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 you know, I've got to make you produce this and get this and blah, 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 you know. I would suggest that nature is actually a benevolent lover just desiring to be caressed in the right places. That's a real different way of looking at our ecological umbilical. <laughs>